Hi there, we are live and now streaming. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, good morning to those in this in America and the Americas and good afternoon or almost good afternoon to everyone. Hey intriguing topic. Uh, it made me stop and think a lot myself uh, about this panel. It's quite subjective and quite personal. And as a result, I think you're going to hear a range of very interesting and thoughtful views on it. Uh, because perhaps even more so, this past year has raised new questions for us about individual behaviour and collective behaviour. We've been put under rules that affect us individually, but are important and necessary for the greater good, for the collective good. And we've all had choices within that about how lockdowns define us as individuals in terms of our time, our behavior, our priorities, our identity. And we've all reacted differently to that. And it has affected us all very directly. So this is not something that's esoteric for anyone, even though the topic may sound somewhat esoteric, uh, it's actually affecting us directly and this is truly global. Uh, so today I'm gonna ask each of our panelists to speak for about three to four minutes uh, and then hopefully at the end we'll have time for questions. Um, so please do drop questions into the chat uh, for this session as you like throughout um, and I'll be looking for those and reading them as they happen. Um, so I'd like to start by turning to Panos Pene, who has joined us. He is the Senior Vice President for the Berkeley College of Music, and I'd invite him to give his opening remarks. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Panos Pene. I'm Senior Vice President uh, for Global Strategy and Innovation at Berkeley College of Music. And I've been thinking a lot about um, the, the fundamental challenge that the pandemic has posed with respect to uh, our identity. Uh, I recently wrote a book that's coming out on April uh, 8th uh, in the UK called uh, Two Beats Ahead, What Musical Minds Can Teach Us About Innovation. And in the book, we talk about these mindsets that musicians have um, and how they're applicable in, in other realms. And one of those is the idea of reinvention. And uh, it's actually caused me to think quite a bit about what we're undergoing right now. But in the book, we use the example of David Bowie and how he was able to sustain um, a 50-year career by continuously reinventing uh, himself. And, of course, in many ways, he set the blueprint for a lot of artists that followed from Madonna, Lady Gaga, and countless others. And I would say before David Bowie, somebody like Miles Davis was a prototypical example of that. And it, it got me thinking about this idea of identity and fundamentally how the pandemic is, is changing or challenging uh, our views of who we are. And I think what distinguished an artist like Bowie is that even though we, I think, recognized him as, as David Bowie throughout his career, he always, uh, uh, what's the word, uh, was able to use metamorphosis as a form of, of, of reinvention. And in some ways, I think that's what we're all undergoing. The pandemic has, has forced us to strip down to our very basic essence of who we are. And it's made us all question, who are we? What, what is persona and what is identity? And um, I, I think in some ways it's been uh, both enlightening and a coping uh, me uh, mechanism. Um, I know that many of my fellow panelists have probably undergone similar existential uh, questions, but I'm wondering to some degree, uh, less so the threat that it poses, but more so the opportunity that it poses for us to look at old world problems with fresh perspectives and, and a fresh set of eyes. 
Um, so as we go throughout the panel, I'd like to explore more this concept of ultimately, how do you strip yourself down to that very basic identity? What is that? And then ultimately, um, how do we use this idea of reinvention uh, as a means of, of advancing and going? Uh, but there's still something there that we identify as him. Um, and I think that the pandemic is, is probably perhaps, again, posing a lot of the same questions for us as individuals, uh, as professionals and as citizens. Thank you for that. Um, I would like to actually now ask uh, our second speaker to give her introductory remarks, um, and that's Ricarda Zedso, who's the Chief Executive Officer of LifeAid, um, to give us her thoughts. Thank you, Ross, and hello, everybody. So this is a very interesting subject. I'm speaking from Italy, and a few years ago, when I became a mother, I realized that... Uh, that, that identity, the fact that I was a mother, for the people around me was overtaking everything else I was. And that was a bit strange for me, especially at work, because I was 36 years old. So there were already, already many layers of identity in me. And the fact that one new layer of identity was overcoming the others and, and creating situations for me was puzzling. And that's why I started really thinking how does a new identity uh, overlaps or combines with the other things we are? And why is it that, what are we showing to, to the world? Are we showing the same layer to, to all the situations or are we showing different layers in different situations? And that's scientifically, I've been studying this subject in the last 10 years. And I discovered that basically we tend to think of ourselves as cakes in which every layer of identity is like a slice. And if, you have, if we have this way of looking at ourselves, then our perception is that the more things we are, the smaller the slice is. And this is what happens, for example, when a woman becomes a mother. There is one extra slice. And in a way, her being a worker might be, her being a professional might be under threat by the identity of being a mother because they are sharing the same cake. But that didn't seem like that to me. Like I had, on the other hand, I was really feeling like this new layer was not uh, stealing space from the others. It was actually enlarging the whole cake. And that was strange. I had to prove this to my workplace. I had to prove that becoming a mother was not uh, stealing uh, resources, but it was adding resources. And that's why I started thinking of new ways I could, we could express, I could express visually what it means to have many layers. And, and I realized that many layers can look like circles uh, that add to each other. So the more layers you have, the bigger your, ident your, your, your territory, the more complex. So the point is that today, especially in the last year, I think we all had to show most of our layers to everybody because I can tell that someone is sitting in a kitchen, I can see the child of someone dropping in and so on. So we already had this complexity in our lives. We, all, all of us in our lives have had a big, big complexity. But in a way, we managed to separate. And we lived in this paradigm of conflicting roles, where you have to show one piece to someone and the other piece to other one. And sometimes you have to ask yourself, which one am I? Do I behave differently in every role? Actually, we do. We do. We do use different characterial traits in every role. But that it was sustainable probably until a few years ago, but now it's not sustainable anymore because of technology, which has broken all the boundaries, because of the pandemia, which is, has broken even more the boundaries, and, and because it's really tiring to decide that you're going to be caring at home and leading at, in the office and have different, uh, show different parts of yourself. And so I think it's very interesting if we, if we talk about this subject and if we start practicing and trying to be ourselves, whatever it means, it's very interesting that uh, Pano said, uh, is there something that defines us deep inside? I think we are constantly changing and we are composing broken pieces and, and we can do that. I think we can change the paradigm and start being 
different things in different moments and showing all of them everywhere and not pretending that it's not like that. And just as a final comment, there are researches that show that the more your roles overlap, so the more you do this, the more you are, you're, you're a father and a manager and a brother and a friend all together at the same time, the more ethical your behavior is going to be. Because you look at yourself in the mirror and you see everything you are. And that makes it more difficult to behave badly. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Salman Ravala, who's a partner uh, at a law firm called Christiane Ravala, if I got that correct, um, to now give us his introductory remarks. Hi, good morning from New York City. Uh, I am Salman. Thanks again for the introduction, and it's nice to be with all of you this morning. So I, I, I want to follow up and, and tag along what Ricardo has just mentioned about this 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 layering, right? And and let me start by answering the very direct question of who we are, because I'm often in front of judges and I'm scolded to be very direct in my response. So I have been trained to try and answer questions very directly. Uh, you know, uh, I am a lawyer. Uh, I am an educator. I sit on several boards related to access to education and scholarship opportunities for young people. And I am a mediator. I help parties resolve conflict. Uh, that is me professionally answering the question of who we are and who I am. Um, but of course, as a father, right, that goes outside of this circle or cake of being a professional to a parent. Uh, and realizing what Ricardo just said is that the more roles you sit in, the more you realize how close you are to other people or how directly connected you are to other people. And this pandemic has certainly brought us all together in that sense of, you know, all the mothers at the kindergarten school or the fathers have very similar concerns about how their child is being raised or taught on Zoom or whatever online platform and how they're concerned about some parents uh, wearing masks and others not when it comes to their children. So, uh, you know, I want to pause here and, 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 and break down when we answer this question of who we are into a professional category, a personal category. And in my um, short 38 years of, of learn the best answer and the best way to identify that is with authenticity. And what do I mean by that? Uh, well, I've explained to you my professional background, my personal family background, but perhaps not my ethnic background or my religious background. And I wonder how much of that makes us. You know, I talked about my background in education and my desire to help other young people. Uh, despite my very, very full load of litigation work and very busy schedule, because that's where that's a part of who I am. This idea that somebody gave me a scholarship and helped me get an education helps me promote that idea for others. So it's naturally ingrained in me, this historical piece of my life connected with my future. And I'll tell you what. Almost all of us, if not all of us, have some sort of a hyphen, right? I grew up in Pakistan. Uh, I am an American Pakistani. I'm a proud American, but I also have an identity, whether it's cultural, religious, or otherwise. And I think we bring in our past to our present and our, and our future. And this idea of a hyphen is, is very important to me because it helps shape us, uh, whether it's faith-based, um, whether it's ethnic based. Um, and so, you know, I, I always question this idea of who, who we are and how that hyphen helps us define what we can be and relate to others. To me, leadership isn't just a question of who we are, but what we do for others. And when we do that for others portion, I think we realize who we are. I'll give you a quick example. I was extremely reluctant to use my religious identity. I don't wear my religious card on my sleeves. I don't talk about it. I don't talk about my ethnic background. I can't really hide it, right? <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I can't I change my skin color, but, but I don't necessarily wear my religion card. And it's interesting, most of the opportunities that have come my way, including an opportunity to speak at conferences, nationally, internationally, and at the White House. I was invited to speak at the White House twice um, 
back about six years ago and then eight years ago was because of the hyphen, was because of my religious or ethnic identity. And I've often thought about how opportunities come to you because of what you may be trying to hide for whatever reasons, whether it's your youth or your inexperience and not being proud of it, uh, to showcase that with authenticity and try to define who you are based on your background and what you can change and, and to own, own up to it. Um, my mediation work brings people together with differences. I'm happy to talk about that in the Q and A, but it's fascinating for me to sit in the, in the seat where I am helping two parties with different interests resolve their disputes. And oftentimes we're asking the question of not necessarily who we are, but what we're here for, right. And what our interests are and, 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 Happy to again talk more on that and not take too much time in the, in the introductory remarks. So I'll pause there. Thank you very much. Looking forward to learning more from all of you. Thank you. Um, I'll turn now to Dionysia Theodora Avgeranopoulou, who is a member of the Hellenic Parliament uh, in Greece. Thank you. Keen to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very honored and very happy to participate in this panel on this very fundamental question on our identity. Um, and I will start from uh, our latest speaker that said what we are for, our goal. Actually, on a personal level, this uh, crisis, the pandemic crisis, um, gave me a little bit more hope because as a member of the parliament and especially chair of the environment committee of the parliament, I saw some transformative, transformative change happening that is actually for the positive. It has um, a very strong symbolism, like citizens in Greece and in other countries with which we are in close cooperation through our parliamentary channels they started realizing how important it is for them to uh, promote environmental and sustainability goals. Because in our discourse, in our everyday discussion in media, in parliament, among friends, we have started discussing about the um, inter interdependence of health, human health uh, and animal health, the health of the nature and our own being in the nature. So this interdependence that we environmentalists, so many decades we try to educate the greater public, I think that within a year uh, it became conscience in uh, a great majority in this world. So people now, they have realized how important it is to keep clean and healthy the environment, how important it is to um, practice sustainable uh, patterns of consumption and production in their own homes, how important it is to recycle, how important it is not to um, have CO2 and other, chemical, other chemicals in the air, how important it is to live a healthy life, to breathe healthy uh, air, because this will keep you healthy enough to cope with COVID-19 and other diseases. Uh, and on the other way around, we found some, uh, let's say so, spare time for ourselves and our family. At least in Greece, uh, we have put ourselves in self-isolation for a very long periods of time. Uh, and we spent time with our families. Uh, I think that was a, a really big gain for many of us. Uh, and we also had the chance to think again on what we are and what we want to do. Um, I'm writing a new book. Um, I have um, reoriented my political work towards a different path. And I remembered once again what my priorities when, uh, um, where, when I was, for example, 10 or 15 years uh, younger and I entered politics. So it gave me the time to think again uh, and reshape my political agenda. And I think that was uh, the um, opportunity for every one of us, uh, at least when we are in leading positions to shape again our agendas. And of course, for many of us, including uh, Greeks, 
that were not very digital savvy, I have to, to say the truth. And although we all have access to social media in Greece, digital Internet, etc., and societies they uh, had access to really um, inter like really um, high speeds of internet only through these few months. So, and um, at the same time, by spending time and thinking on our life and health and planet, we also uh, watch the news on what is going on in other places on the planet. And by doing that, us, our citizens, they started understanding that they are not alone facing this crisis, uh, but we are all together in this. And from this individual stance in life, I think that we made some steps forward. The identity of the global citizen uh, ever than before because we know that we isolate ourselves in order to protect ourselves and the others. And we know that we have to do that because we want to tackle COVID-19 for the sakes of others as well. And we have learned as citizens that not only our governments, but also international organizations and the international expert community and so on, all these networks around the world, we are fighting towards the same end the same goal. So I think that it was and it still is uh, a great lesson on how to move forward from our individualist point of view to the global sense on who we are. And the same stands true for the cities, for the countries, uh, because many countries um, and especially the uh, most powerful countries, they faced uh, many situations from an individualist point of view. Uh, as superpowers, but now they have realized that they have really to move forward a multilateralist way of life. So it was a lesson from both the individual and the countries on how to work together and succeed the goals that they pose. And I hope that these lessons, the very, very fundamental lesson on the fact that we should all work together, would be extrapolated in other challenges as well. Thank you. So I'll just invite our final uh, panellist to give his opening remarks and then a reminder to people if you have questions that you'd like to put towards the panellists to please pop them in the in the comment section for me. Um, so uh, to wrap us up, uh, I would ask to, to invite Matthias Bosch, who's the Executive Coordinator of Global Dignity, uh, to give us his thoughts. Thank you very much. <clears throat> what a wonderful panel, interesting um, start and walks of life we hear here. And and that question really hit home for us, who we are, who we are, because it is at the end about dignity. And so Global Dignity is <clears throat> an organization that was founded in 2006 at the World Economic Forum in, in Davos. And um, so we are teaching, we go into schools, we educate on the topic of dignity. And dignity is really what I hear also here with all the walks of life, somehow the focal point where things come together, whether it's David Bowie or your story, Salman, where you have a lot going on. Also, your story with Ricarda about being a mom, being an entrepreneur, being busy. It is all about our personality. And so we have this triangle of labels that people put on us, our identity and the acceptance. So when we go out and teach people about how, you know, how dignity works and what dignity is, dignity is you know, everybody is born with dignity. It is our inherent value and dignity is an extricable part of what it means to be human. So there are so many things that divide us, ethnicities, religion, skin color, um, gender, politics, borders and status. But dignity is the great equalizer and it cuts through all divisions and unites us and in our shared humanity. And this is actually the answer to the question here. We are who we are. We are all humans. And that is what we try to teach people also with conflict resolutions. First, try to step back and see the human you have in front of you, not the attorney, not the Pakistani American, not the mother or the, the musician or the producer or the, the parliamentarian. 
It's about the human first. And then, and then you define um, not who the person is. Let the person define itself or himself or herself, how see, she or, her, um, or him sees himself. And then it's about the acceptance. So if you say you are a Pakistani American lawyer, this is your definition and this is your identity. And I am not allowed to question that. I have to accept that. And that is the first step to take you as you are. And not for me to say, oh, well, you look like you could be someone else. And I put this label on you. And then you have to come back and tell me, no, that's not how I am, who I am. I am somebody else. So the first step is that we are going back down to the very bottom of it and say, we are all humans. And let the person define and give the identity. And this is what a, a wonderful example you gave is David Bowie. He always was the person who was defining himself antagonic and kind of being then um, an, an artist, um, an actor, a musician, a producer. But he always defined himself and we had to accept him. And this was a very interesting um, kind of phenomenon. Just when you mentioned it about David Bowie, I find it so interesting. He is pretty much a person who really was able to define and redefine, but he was always accepted because he was a great artist. It's much easier for him. For us, it's always difficult because we are sometimes come along and saying, well, um, I like your example, Ricarda, um, you are as a, you come as an entrepreneur and then you're all of a sudden you are a mother and people put this label mother on you, but you still are the entrepreneur. And, and this is something that is unfair because the, you don't want to be identified in your job as mother. You want to be identified as the boss or the supervisor or somebody else. And so stepping back and seeing the human and let the person define and identify first and accept that is what we try to teach. And it helps. It's interesting phenomenon now that we talk about it. When you try to do this yourself, first see the human, not the woman, not the attorney, not the entrepreneur. It changes something how you view that person and let the person come to you how to identify them and accept it. Thank you. That was my opening remark. I, I, may I build a bit on what Matthias was talking about? Absolutely. Please go ahead. And, 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 and the only see and all my fellow panelists. Yeah, you know, it's fascinating because in many ways, even looking at that example of a David Bowie, even though he's continuously changed, there is a truth that we all recognize as David Bowie. Uh, even though it's hard for us to point our finger on that, like who was he? As a matter of fact, he's, He's both somebody extremely well known until the day he died. I'm not sure if we all really knew who he was. But I think for me, I'm using David Bowie as an example because I think we're all David Bowie's in many ways. We just don't realize that. Right. And it's been interesting for me personally to experience the pandemic because almost all of our coping mechanisms and everything that we took as truth were just taken away. I mean, from little things like watching football on television to big things like I was somebody who got on a plane for half the year and traveled all over the world um, as part of my job. Um, I went to a certain office. I drove a certain car. I lived in a certain house. The pandemic took most of that away, uh, but it actually forced me to even reconsider where I work. Right now I'm sitting in Cyprus, my home country, which I had not lived in since I was 19. Um, I don't work at an office. The concept of a workplace is is changed. Like, what is a workplace after all? I mean, we're all having this panel, and I don't even know where any of you are. Um, I, I have some hypothesis. You could be at home. You could be at, at an office. So I think it's it's interesting how, in many ways, I see this as a good thing. I I, I see this as a way for us to sort of strip back all the facades strip back all of the things that we cling to and hold on to. And almost by changing that, can we reimagine what we can be both individually and collectively? And in looking again at that example of a David Bowie or a Miles Davis or a Lady Gaga, part of the way that they've reinvented themselves and therefore have been able to sustain long careers is by changing their environments, changing their surroundings, changing even their own costumes. I mean, I was joking with my wife that for the last seven months, all I've worn, I think the first time I've worn a jacket since the pandemic hit, because most of them just t-shirt. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, but isn't it isn't it interesting that it's in some ways it's both dehumanized us, but also completely humanized us um, in ways right. that we just never expected. But you couldn't identify yourself now with your planes and your cars and all of that because all we see now is Hugh Panos as you are. So I see only the human and you, you cannot garner around yourself all these data symbols because nobody can see them and kind of, you know, so you cannot identify them with that. You have to identify as you are. And so we have to take you and accept it and, and see that is somehow healthy to a certain extent. This is something actually I wanted to pick up on and ask Ricardo about because this idea of, I think she was saying like, you know, we've always had different traits that we've applied to ourselves in different roles and different ways, whether it's here I am in the workplace traveling, um, how I define myself as someone who flies here and does that, here I am at home, um, and how um, we can increasingly bring those traits into the, the entirety of our lives. Uh, and maybe over the past year, for example, it's shown us that it's okay to be a bit more vulnerable in the workplace because our lives are messy and, and everything comes in and our kids are around us all the time and whatever. But my question for Ricardo, I guess, in that is like, do you think that that what we think of still as the workplace is, is entirely ready for that, for us to bring our, our whole selves into our work rather than a version of ourselves every day? Is workplace change still needed? For that or societal change for that to happen truly and in a yeah i don't think that uh, i'm afraid i'm so afraid that's my biggest fear at the moment is that things will do whatever they can to go back to whatever it was before oh, yeah so not learning not changing not acknowledging everything that we are learning right now an incredible opportunity we are having and actually the point is the system is set to defend itself from change so the forces against change are very strong. There is a reason for that. And that's why I think we all need to express the need for this change. We, we all need to be brave and put out all those dimensions, the vulnerability, the, 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 the caring, the fear, and put them out as much as possible. We have to do it, the ones who are in the room right now, because if we are here, there is a reason. And I think the main reason is, is networking around change and a different kind of change because no the answer is no the system is not ready the society i mean the society is already there in a way but the picture we're, we're seeing is still an old picture and changing the picture which means changing the framework the frames around reality is very hard because those frames in a way they are creating sense of security and so people will try to go back there and to feel secure again that way. So I, I want to be sure because I want to leave room to the others, but this is what I think. We need to, to make an effort, a strong effort, a, a conscious effort. Well, because I wanted to ask Dinesha about that as well, because we, I mean, as you pointed out, people now see the collective benefit of environmental. This is only through sort of, I guess, suffering that we are forced to change. Uh, and what, is that the only way that we can evolve from this from this moment? Um, or do you think that people have seen enough how they're linked to each other and our fortunes are linked to each other so much that the idea of collective, like changing for the collective good is still there when it comes to things like the environment? Well, um, first of all, I don't think that a society could be forced to change. If the society is not ready to change, then the society will not really substantially change, not for good, not in essence. So I think that um, there is uh, an opportunity and it is happening through this crisis uh, for a society to take some lessons learned, some good examples, some positive practices and adapt. Uh, and society is doing that. Like uh, in Greece, uh, I could see that people, they were not exercising that much. It was not an everyday reality. It was not on our schedule, on the daily schedule to exercise. I could say, say that. And now uh, due to the pandemic, and due to the fact that the government allow us to go out of the house for a specific time and for specific reasons, like to go to the doctor, to go to your office or to go to the supermarket or to go to gym. 
to get some exercise. So that was one excuse. So people, they started getting more and more exercise in their everyday lives. And they have kept this habit up to now. Uh, and they have uh, started getting exercise uh, as families. So you could see mother and children, father and children to go out and get exercise together. So they are learning, but they were also ready to learn something like that. And uh, the society was ready to move forward from just Facebook and other social media to really teleworking and to e-schooling, but we did not have the real need to do so. So the society, due to the new needs that existed, they did not have enough time to spend alone in their houses and learn how to do it. And learn actually the why, the reason why you should save the planet, why you should keep your planet healthy. Why is it yourself, your being, your dignity, your life, dignity in the means of environmental justice, for example? Uh, why is it all connected? So now through this um, really very hard experience, we learned that everything is connected. I think that we took a step back and we really learned the reason why, which is very important because you have to have a reason, you have to have a vision, you have to know what you're doing in order to do it properly. Now on the other way around, I hear and I share the view that the system, the systems in plural, they would like to go back in their old ways of life. This is always a possibility, a very strong possibility. And to a certain extent, it might be to the right direction. However, we have to keep the best of both worlds, the best on what we had before and the best of what we have now. And let's not keep out of the equation the reality of the health care system. Because in the essence of this, it's not our individual um, development, our capacities or innovation. It's not the environment. Regarding the um, the ignorance of the public health system or regarding the ignorance of the global networks about the uh, betterment, the amelioration of health, regarding also the realization, what we have seen in our TVs, in our uh, internet uh, sources, about the differences that exist in healthcare between different countries because we discuss all these uh, issues of change and identity uh, and what we have been benefited through the crisis from the point of view, if I don't mind you saying so, of the Western world. I'm not sure what the Africans would have to say about that or some Asian countries. to see what the different levels of development are in the world now more than ever. And I would like to leave this as an open-ended uh, discussion, maybe from another panel, but it's important as well. Thank you. Um, and just to say, we're literally almost out of time. We've got about a minute left, but I wanted to ask um, Sam and Matthias, actually both 30 seconds on this this final question which is like what is from your perspective the role of that when you think about the role of the courts of, of institutions of governments in this when we think about identity as well it's not just us as individuals but the role that leaders um in these in these structures be them courts or governments can play in helping that and i wonder what your observations are around that including perhaps with the recent change of administration in the States. So I think you've got about 45 seconds each on that one, and then we have to um, wrap it up. Uh, please. Uh, sure. Look, I, I think courts and institutions 
need to practice neutrality. I think neutrality is key here when you're dealing with different who we are questions. The responses to who we are are going to be different. So neutrality and independence, especially in, in, in what we've seen here, at least in the United States, independence with the attorney general's office, with judges. So I'll leave it to to those two buzzwords, if, if that helps, and I'll let uh, our, our, our fellow speaker comment. Yeah. I, I can only echo that, but in addition, I think we have seen that in the last couple